is newer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, hello, everybody. We are, as you said, Bissam uh, Betram from Unistad Jami Brime and Tracy Morel from Stad Al Khan. Uh, we're here today to present this talk entitled Three Minutes Thesis uh, Presentations and Multimodal on Genre Based Approach to Teach and Analyze Doctoral Students' Performances. Oops. Yeah. Well, as you know, ESP and EAP courses are typically designed to address the, the students' needs and to deal with the specific uh, professional and academic genres. Nevertheless, with the ongoing advances in digital communication, uh, audiovisual materials, and of course, with the advent of multimodal communication, um, genres have evolved in a way, giving rise to new genres such as uh, video abstract, as is more than discussed by, by Dr. Luthon from the South Arabotha. And today we're going to talk about a specific new genre that it can be considered within this family of digital genres, which is yes. new cases presentations that is defined as a com new competitive academic speed genre that gives PhD students the opportunity to present in three minutes the ongoing research to a mixed disciplinary audience before a panel of judges. This is the, the genre that we're going to explore in this, in this study, but instead of taking the perspective of a competition, we're taking the perspective of the students performing 3MT presentations. Well, the first 3MT competition was held at the University of Queensland, Australia, back in 2008, and it has expanded since then to over 100 universities in over 85 uh, countries worldwide. If we focus on Spain, we can see that, that there are 27 universities at the moment holding 3MT competitions, and actually Universidad de Alacán is included on this list. Although my university, my home university is not included, I try to deal with this genre in my classes with doctoral students that take a course that I give for an academic English that I will explain later on. Well, the two research questions guiding this study are how can uh, 3MT presentations be taught with a multimodal genre approach? How do students, not these researchers, present content and engage the audience? But as we are interested in exploring how we as lecturers can deal with this specific genre in the EAP classroom from this uh, multimodal perspective and dealing with the genre and in examining how students present content and of course engage with their audiences through these type of presentations. The data set of this study uh, involves uh, uh, sorry, doctoral students from varied uh, disciplines uh, studying at the Universidad de Primer. These students and the participants, the same, uh, are enrolled in an EAP course at a teach university, which focuses on both uh, written and spoken academic genres, being 3MT presentations, one of these spoken genres that we focus on. And the data for this study is made up of 18 video recorded 3MT presentations. And I started collecting the data a year ago, just right before the, the, the outbreak. So we got some like some in-class recordings and some online recordings that got, you know, combination of videos because of the situation. Now, today we are presenting just one uh, example. I mean, we, could, we could have presented 18, but it's kind of impossible. So we just focus on one of these videos, uh, particularly the video of a student uh, enrolled uh, in a doctoral program belonging to the field of education. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the approach that we follow to deal with this gender in the classroom. We have drawn on the model proposed by Carol, Julian and Fernanda Gomez, in which they discuss how spoken genders can be dealt with from a multimodal perspective that is taking into account the variety of communicative modes speakers might may, may use may, may use to construct discourse. And actually, the study by Carol, Julian, and Fernanda Gomez focused on uh, conference presentation and discussion session. And the data they, they use actually is actually is taken from the very same course that I'm that I'm teaching. And this model consists of three stages. The first one, joint construction, 
joint deconstruction, sorry, the second joint construction, and the third independent construction. While the first two are more teacher supported stages, the third one is more autonomous. Now let's talk about the first one. In this stage, a uh, specific model text, in this case, uh, authentic 3MT presentations are uh, explored in the, in the classroom. We deconstruct them through demonstration, modeling, and discussion, which means that the specific aspects dealing with language, features of the, of the specific genre, or the main communicative, uh, communicative uh, goal are progressively deconstructed by the lecturer. And then the students are, in a way, lead through this deconstruction to learn how to elaborate their own sample. In the second stage is where students start constructing together with the, with the lecturer similar texts. And of course, in this, in this particular stage, scaffolding is given if necessary. So they can, in a way, you know, stick to the rules or the, or the, or the conventions of this new genre. And then in the last stage, independent construction, students are encouraged to construct the 3 mt presentation independently, although scaffolding and extra support might be given if needed. Now, here you see some of the basic rules guiding um, the, the 3 mt presentation, and this information is, is taken from the website of University of Sussex, which also holds uh, this type of uh, presentations. These rules, as you can see, are the use of a single static uh, PowerPoint slide. No slide transition, innovation of movement are permitted. Slide is to be presented from the beginning of operation. And no additional electronic media, such as sound, video, files, etc., are permitted. To deal with this gender in the classroom, uh, we use uh, the paper published by Ku and Lu to explore the different uh, rhetorical moves that 3 mt presentations consist of. And then we, we explore these moves according to the samples we, we examine yes. and they construct them accordingly. These moves uh, can be either uh, obligatory and optional. So the obligatory would be orientation, rational, purpose, methods, implication and termination, and framework and results would be optional. And now, Mark and Trisa will continue with the presentation to answer the second research question. The first research question has already answered with this explanation about the pedagogical perspective. Mm -hmm. So, Trisa, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, to be able to answer the second question was, uh, how do students actually uh, perform these three uh, minute uh, uh, thesis presentations. Um, we looked at uh, this model. It's a systemic, functional, and multimodal framework uh, in which we, we look at first the content, the ideational metafunction, and then uh, we look at the textual. Uh, the textual uh, has already been explained by Vicent when he explained the different moves that are used uh, and which the students uh, have actually covered. Some uh, have covered all of them and some not all of them, uh, the optional ones especially. And what we were most concerned about was the interpersonal metafunction, the engagement, how the students were able to engage the audience. We have to remember that these doctoral students uh, come from different fields and of course they have their own uh, special uh, specialities and therefore they cannot speak to us as as scientists, uh, because we are not all familiar with their fields. So it's the idea of democratization of science. So we wanted to see how they did that. Uh, and uh, what we did is we looked more carefully at a specific example that we're now going to be looking at. I need to change the slide. Yes. Okay, so the sample that we've taken uh, is from a student uh, from education. And her uh, three minute thesis was about inclusion and in education of children with learning difficulties. Uh, and she actually covered all of the rhetorical moves. In those three minutes, uh, we've analyzed them carefully, and she does uh, cover all the, the moves. But we we're mostly interested in what she did in the first uh, one or two uh, of her moves, the orientation. Um, can you go on, please? 
Okay. In the rhetorical, the first rhetorical move orientation engagement, here's when the uh, listener is given orientation. This is where we start the presentation, and this is where the audience uh, should be engaged. And this is a particular example, she was did a very good job. And she also needs to give the content orientation, which is providing the background information needed uh, to understand what her study is about. And in her case, she starts by saying, imagine that you are an eight-year-old child in a school. So it's very to interrupt me, just to let you know that you have five minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and, in, uh, and what she does, she actually narrates the story of a child with learning difficulties and asks us to reflect on feelings, uh, on our own feelings, if we were pulled out of a classroom each day. Okay, and she does this by first evoking positive emotions and then evokes negative emotions, and then she assumes what the audience uh, would feel. Okay, uh, this morning, uh, when, well, yesterday when I was listening to uh, Maria Angeles Ort's talk about emotion uh, and genre, I said, well, this is very closely related, how emotions are so important, especially for engaging the audience. And this particular ex example of, uh, that we're looking at, she did a very good job. And she does this verbally and non-verbally. Uh, she started out by saying, imagine that you are in a classroom with your peers. She uses the referential you to refer to the audience, so they become part of it. Yeah. And her nonverbal uh, cues are, are also very interesting because they also work to engage the audience. Her gaze, she's looking uh, at all times, looking at the camera, uh, addressing the audience, and her gestures, her, she beats and she has her palms up. And this is a sign of, of uh, in, engagement uh, that m most speakers use. And of course, her body posture is frontal facing the audience. Do you want to go on, Vicente? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then, uh, so she begins with this, uh, evoking this positive emotion by saying, you are in a friendly atmosphere. You know? Again, the referential you, referring to the audience and her nonverbal, her gaze. Note, in this case, she's looking up, looking up and, and also using the gestures, the iconic gestures of representing the atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, and again, her body is frontal facing the audience. Okay, Vicent. And then she goes on to a, a negative emotion and she tries to evoke the negative emotion by saying, someone takes you from your classroom. Yeah. And she uses this iconic, yeah. uh, she, she uh, is in the center from the inside kind of like a little classroom to the outside of the classroom. And her, and her gaze shifts from the center also out to the left. Again, her body posture is frontal. Want to go on, Vicente? And then um, she continues with, you, you don't understand the purpose. And have a look at uh, her facial expression. She's like squinting her eyes and her hands are towards her body. Uh, she's, um, and this, this gesture is accompanying the speech. Uh, she's kind of like giving a confused look on her face. And again, she's facing the audience. Okay, and then uh, she finally, in, in this orientation move, she's assuming what the audience would feel. Okay, she's already put us through that little story, and then she kind of stops a second, allows us to think, and she says, it has to be really shocking. Yeah? Uh, and for that, she puts on a serious face. Uh, she's looking at the, the camera, uh, and she joins her hands together at rest, and her head is tilted to the left. You know, um, encouraging reflection, you know, and again, she's facing the audience. Okay, Vicente? Okay. As a conclusion, we could say for our first research question, how can the three MT presentations be taught? Well, we've seen that Vicente has been able to use a multimodal genre-based approach, uh, which actually serves to raise students' awareness of both the verbal and nonverbal construction of the three MT presentations. Uh, and um, we both feel that this type of instruction definitely develops students' multimodal communicative competence, which is so important nowadays. Okay, um, on many of the talks that we've been hearing to in in in, the Texas, uh, in, in this conference have referred to that multimodality and engagement, and and how it's so important for us as speakers, as researchers, to be able to communicate um, um, not 
not only through our speech, but through our uh, different modes. Yeah? And um, it's also, uh, we're also able to teach them by implementing those three stage, stages of the genre-based approach that is, uh, and at and, and the same time, focusing on both the verbal and nonverbal resources, the joint deconstruction, the joint construction, and the independent construction. Make sense? And in our second question, how do students present content and engage the audience? Well, from the ideational perspective, we've seen that they convert field specific discourse into conversational style to reach the non expert audiences. Okay, um, going back to what uh, Carmen was saying before about mm, it might be a fallacy that we can't all enjoy science. Well, it depends if the if the speaker or if the communicator is able to democratize, you know, and, and, and that's what these students are taught to do. And so that anyone can really understand it. Okay, uh, and then at, at the technical level, um, they are actually going through those rhetorical steps because they've been trained to do it. You know? And the interpersonal, we've seen that they've combined varied semiotic resources to engage the audience. As we've seen in this example, she evokes empathy and she stimulates a positive and negative emotions through the use of personalized speech, like the, the referential you, uh, with her gaze and her gestures, her facial expressions and a body posture. So it all kind of like works together. Okay, so that's basically what we wanted to communicate. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lenz and Vanessa, for your presentation. We have time for a couple of questions. Um, I have a question for both of you from Susana Pastor. Thank you. Do you think that this academic genre will be the way to present things in the future? Which to present, sorry. To sorry, present. To present what, sorry? To yeah, present, to present, to present the future. future. I, I think she meant dissertations, all right. Okay, um, if, if you want, I, I can take that for you. Uh, well, uh, it, as as we've mentioned, it's like a competitive type of a, of, of event that is now used for. I'm not sure if we're going to be presenting theses in the future in three right. minutes, but uh, what I do think is that uh, it's a way <laughs> of uh, having many people find out what we're doing uh, in our own fields, you know, and, and to make uh, science more democratized. So I believe that theses will continue as they have until, well, or similar to, to today. Yeah, yeah. But we perhaps will have more events in which people are will be allowed to or will be presenting what they've done in three minutes. You know, I, yeah. I can imagine many people who have done their doctoral theses uh, might be going online and and putting on their web pages or or on their own social medias. Their three minute, you know, presentations for all their friends and people to know what they've done. How many of you who've done your doctorates and people ask you, what's your doctorate about? How do you explain it? Well, <laughs> well, if we practice it like that, you know, with three minutes and, and you know, try to arrive at the lay people. Yeah. Yeah, okay, totally. Thank you. We have a last question. Um, how long does it take the instruction training for each stage until students are able to present their thesis in three minutes? Okay, uh, well, this course, uh, as I said before, has like two sections, like spoken and, and written and the spoken. I have about uh, six, uh, eight hours, eight hours. So I devote about three hours to start analyzing and elaborating their their own uh, three minutes thesis presentation. And then, of course, they work at home with this and they can contact me and I give some extra support. So let's say that about um, three hours in class, then the rest they work at home. But definitely, it takes more than three hours. It implies thinking about what you want to say, how to want to say it, and then it also involves uh, editing and video recording, etc. So they need to develop not only this multimodal communicative competence, and this is something that involves language and communicative modes per se, but also digital competence that can be, of course, understood. It's part of multimodal communicative competence, but yeah, it's, it's quite long for them and they suffer a lot during the whole process because it's something very new. And as Teresa was saying, they need to put this information in, you know, just three minutes. So it's really demanding for them. Right. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Vicente. Uh, we've got, I've got more questions, but we have to move on to comply with the program. Thank you both for your insight you. presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's move on then. Next, uh, our next speaker is Maria Lisa Fina from the University of Venice. 
Maria Lisa, I'm going to share. Yeah. All right. Can you can you can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Fine. So um, I think. Uh, right. Here we are. Here. There you go. Excellent. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yes. That's perfect. Okay, excellent. All right, so, so the floor is yours. I'll let you know five minutes before the end of your presentation so that you know, okay? Okay, thank you thank so you. much. How do I get rid of the... Uh, um, I'm sorry, because... Okay, that's fine. Um, so, hello everyone, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I would like to begin my talk uh, with a brief observation about the concept of popularization, uh, which has been defined as the uh, transformation of specialized knowledge into everyday or uh, lay knowledge. Um, now, when discussing popularization, a, a key issue related to popularization is uh, um, popularizing for whom, uh, in any form of communication, the target audience we are addressing is essential because um, it is the type of audience which determines uh, popularization strategies. So when I began this um, uh, study, I uh, felt I had to define popularization within museum discourse for children. Um, and uh, I wondered, okay, but what is specialized knowledge in museum discourse for children? And I think it can be defined as the complex whole, which includes the story behind the artwork, Works, the way people or objects are represented and similar issues. And I think we should be careful here because uh, what for an adult audience uh, could be not specialized usually becomes specialized knowledge for children. So, in my view, um, in museum discourse, popularization should aim to make communication accessible to children, and by accessible, I mean uh, facilitating understanding, and uh, um, make communication pleasant for children while preserving the educational aim of the muse museum experience. So, basically, popularization should aim to enhance children's museum experience while preserving both the entertainment components and the education educational uh, component. Um, so uh, my research question is, uh, what are popularization practices in the uh, pictorial descriptions, the Museum of Modern Art, uh, for um, uh, specifically designed for children? Um, so I will briefly illustrate the data, the theoretical background and the methodological approach. Uh, then I will um, list uh, a number of key features characterizing the uh, Museum of Modern Art pictorial descriptions for children. Uh, and uh, I bring practical examples from the corpus, which will be uh, analyzed multimodally. And I will conclude uh, discussing the types of relations activated by um, in these uh, pictorial descriptions. Okay, uh, so the data include 22 minute long audio delivered pictorial descriptions in English for children. And uh, these were downloaded from the official website of the museum and uh, checked for consistency with the uh, audio, of course. Uh, and I used uh, um, QDA Manalite, which is a software for qualitative analysis, uh, which I used for script annotation. And the script annotation took place uh, by using five code categories, which which I will illustrate um, soon. Um, so I carried out a multimodal discourse analysis in order to identify the key popularization strategies enacted in the pictorial descriptions. Now, uh, since the uh, pictorial descriptions are delivered um, orally, um, so they are audio delivered, um, they are investigated as soundscapes, uh, which um, is a Mm, complex semiotic system in which speech, music, and other sounds interact and integrate to create some meaning potential. Of the uh, seven criteria characterizing value and soundscape, I focused on uh, interaction of voices, and uh, by voice I mean voice as human voice, voice as music, voice as sound, and voice as prosody. So we will be looking at the interplay between speech, music, and uh, sounds, and uh, how this contribute to uh, meaning making and popularization. Uh, this is the list of uh, the um, uh, pictorial descriptions included 
uh, in the corpus. And for those not in the know, this is how uh, QDA Manolite works. So on your left, there is uh, the list of um, the code categories which are used for annotation, which are type of speaker, speech uh, with different types of questions and invitations, music, uh, sounds and prosody. In the middle, you have the uh, script and on your right, you can see the annotations and uh, the software was very useful because it allowed me to retrieve um, all the segments for each code, but also to detect overlapping codes uh, for the same uh, segments. Uh, what are the key features of these pictorial descriptions? Uh, generally speaking, they include a narrative or descriptive phase followed by an explorative phase. However, the boundaries between uh, these two different phases are often blurred and uh, they are often blended because of the substantial use of uh, questions, narrative questions, didactic rhetorical questions, but also questions uh, whose actual aim is to describe the painting by stimulating uh, children's uh, critical thinking. Uh, another feature, another key feature, I would say, uh, is the dialogic dimension. Uh, dialogues may take place between the narrator and the kids involved in the narration, but also narrator and uh, um, uh, actors. Um, and also frequent use of invitations, sometimes, sometimes also indirect invitations, to identify items, to interact with the artwork, to imagine, feel, think, adopt a specific point of view, play games and so on. Um, dramatization, um, that is actors are employed to bring to life the story behind the artwork and uh, as a consequence uh, cinematic techniques. So confirmatory sounds and or evocative music are embedded in the narration to enhance concepts and create vivid pictures in the listener's mind. Um, so let's start with the uh, practical examples. Uh, example number one is the sleeping gypsy. Uh, and the script begins uh, uh, with the sound uh, um, reproducing the grunting of a lion, uh, thus focusing the child's attention on the lion depicted in the painting. But later, uh, well, immediately after, um, we have uh, didactic questions uh, which prompt uh, the young listener to identify the uh, items in the painting and describe what's uh, happening. And it is here that the dialogic dimension comes into play because uh, uh, we have kid one and kid two interacting with the narrator, providing their own descriptions of the artwork, but also hypothesizing about uh, the uh, characters uh, um, in the painting. For example, maybe she's a musician and uh, here we have popularization performed by extraverbal uh, element. Uh, with the music performed by a mandolin, which is the instrument lying next to the gypsy. Uh, towards the end of the script, we have questions again, this time narrative questions, uh, which are questions about um, possible outcomes uh, in the story. Is he going to eat her or uh, is he here to protect her? Uh, which stimulate the uh, child's uh, imagination, critical thinking and uh, uh, to learn uh, something um, through uh, observation of the painting. The second example is the migrants arrived in great numbers. In this script, uh, we have an actor impersonating the train driver taking the migrants to uh, Northern America. And uh, uh, what is interesting is that the famous narrator is immersed in the scene. She's on the train and she asks the train driver what, what is going on. So here the dialogic dimension takes place between the, um, uh, the famous narrator and uh, the actor impersonating the train driver. And in my view, this is extremely interesting because it means that the formal relationship between the expert narrator and the non-expert um, uh, young listener is neutralized by the fact that the explanations are provided by one of the characters uh, involved in the story. And uh, here we have a key example. When so many people travel, it's called a migration. Now, migration is a common concept for us, which uh, who uh, we are adults, uh, I mean, but this could be specialized knowledge for uh, children, especially um, uh, very little ones. Uh, so uh, also look at the uh, pause uh, before the word a migration, which emphasizes the concept and uh, make it more memorable for our children. Um, 
Uh, so also notice the use of uh, sounds reproducing uh, the noises produced by the steam train. And when uh, the uh, sounds end, uh, the dramatization ends as well. And uh, uh, this marks the beginning of standard narration um, delivered by the female narrator. Uh, this is probably my favorite example, uh, The Magician by Du Buffet. Um, it's my favorite because uh, this time the artwork is brought to life by an actor who impersonates the artwork itself, the magician. Uh, so uh, we can see that the child is immediately placed within a dimension of magic. We have this uh, spell uh, matched by the sound reproducing a charm. Uh, and uh, the magician immediately creates a connection between the listener and the artwork by addressing the uh, uh, children as a young sorcerer's apprentice. Uh, and he basically introduces himself and starts narrating his story. Um, now, in terms of popularization, what is the key concept behind this artwork? It's uh, the concept of transformation, the ability to transform something by means of artistic imagination. Um, and this concept is popularized throughout the script by, by means of substantial use of soundscape. So we have this evocative music uh, in the background, which is contrasted by uh, the vibrato, uh, tense, rough voice of the magician, which makes the story more compelling. Uh, and we have sounds reproducing charms uh, each time the concept of transformation is involved, which is marked by the conjunction and, uh, which is um, uh, stressed in terms of prosody and, and, um, and uh, uh, also notice the use of pauses uh, before key concepts, for example, transform me into art. And uh, towards the end of the uh, description, the Victoria description, we can see that once again, the uh, child's critical thinking and imagination is uh, uh, stimulated uh, with a question which aims to create a connection between the artwork and the child's own everyday life uh, experience. Sorry, Marisa, just to let you know that you have five minutes. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks. Um, in this fourth example from the Red Studio by uh, Matisse, we can see again the key role uh, performed by uh, questions. So here the question um, aims to guide the uh, children through the uh, exploration of the artwork and more specifically um, helps the child identify the difference in the way um, uh, the works of art and the objects which are prosodically stressed are represented differently in the painting. And also notice the four second musical pause, which presumably um, allows enough time for the young listener to observe the painting and probably catch this difference. And after this musical pause, the key to the question, the solution to the question is provided by the uh, narrator. Um, in this uh, um, example, Still Life uh, by a Wesselman, um, well, uh, together with dramatization, we have uh, another form of edutainment, which is gamification, because uh, children are invited to play a memory game. Uh, and uh, here, a key role is played by music, because the type of music used here is uh, uh, the music used in TV quiz shows, for example. And the music changes according to the different phases of uh, the game. Um, so this is a way to um, uh, popularize uh, art by um, inviting children to play games because children are more likely to learn not only by observing, uh, but also by doing something, in this case by playing. And here we have two um, further examples of uh, gamification because we have these invitations. If you look at the utterances in red, these are invitations to do something uh, to create a sort of a connection with the artwork. Uh, but these are not just invitations to um, playfully enjoy the artwork. It's also a way to stimulate children's critical thinking and uh, uh, get a direct experience of the artwork rather than uh, just a mere uh, and passive observation. 
uh, okay, I think it's time for conclusions. Uh, so, um, popularization strategies in these pictorial descriptions are enacted by Soundscape, and uh, Soundscape uh, activates both semantic and cognitive relations. Uh, in terms of semantic relations, Soundscape is exploited to bring to life the story behind the artwork, enhance the scene by means of sounds which are used as immersive triggers to create vivid pictures in the uh, young listeners mind, uh, make the meaning of the artwork manifest to children. So what is implicit is make explicit through soundscape, dialogic dimension, uh, dramatization, gamification, and so on. However, this does not happen at the, expense, uh, at the expenses of the educational function of the museum experience, because it is here that cognitive relations come into play. And I'm sure you notice that the child's observation skills and critical thinking are continuously triggered by uh, questions and invitations which make the exploration of the artwork as the child's own discovery as opposed to the lecturing approach for example uh, gamification and the dialogic dimension um, create some active engagement as opposed to passive staring at the artwork uh, which make uh, children uh, fall asleep and uh, uh, prosody music and sounds are combined combined uh, meaningfully to make these tasks more appealing now this is just a small study and uh, my original plan was to explore uh, practices for popular popularizing art in Italian museums but also in uh, museums in Europe the pandemic stopped this project I hope to resume it very soon but I think it could be starting point for getting to best practices for uh, inclusive uh, museums. Thank you for listening and uh, I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marilisa, for sticking to the time frame. Right, we have time for a couple of questions. I'll be checking in the chat. Our oh, panelists are welcome to use your microphones, right? You don't have to use a chat if you want to ask any questions on the microphone. Right, I've got, um, Elise, I've got a question for you, which um, you mentioned on um, one of the parameters in the, your study, which was age for children. My point is, do you, uh, um, uh, do you make any distinctions on the, uh, on the types of uh, materials you use, depending on the age? Uh, depending, sorry, I, I can't hear you very well. Oh, sorry, sorry, let me get closer to the computer. Um, I was talking about age. Okay. Uh, do you make any distinctions on the age of the subjects of the children? Um, well, uh, I uh, downloaded the uh, pictorial descriptions uh, which were available uh, at that time uh, on the um, uh, museums. In terms of age, well, um, is this what you, I'm sorry because my audio is a bit disturbed. Were you talking about age? Age, that's right. Okay, yeah. okay. Well, um, there is no specific indications about this suggested uh, the optimal age um, uh, for these pictorial descriptions. I presume we are, um, well, this is for school children. Um, yes, because of the cinematic techniques and this um, prompted with questions, I think it's for uh, primary school, basically. Right, okay. But yeah. there is no specific indication uh, uh, in the website. But don't you think the uh, results might have, uh, perhaps might have been different for children of five years old or 10 years old? Uh, that, that, that's interesting. Well, um, maybe uh, some aspects, probably aspects uh, a bit more difficult, probably related to the um, maybe uh, the artist's uh, life uh, or um, the artist aspects of life which inspire the story would have been included uh, in uh, uh, pictorial descriptions uh, uh, addressing um, uh, maybe teenagers rather than mm -hmm. uh, primary school children. Uh, I had a look at the scripts uh, for 
the a general audience and uh, I noticed that the focus is on specific details in the painting and the connections with aspects of uh, uh, the artist's life which inspired specific techniques or specific subject and we don't find this in these pictorial descriptions for children because it could be a bit too complex and uh, I think also the duration, uh, the length of the pictorial descriptions matter because they last over two minutes and no more. Uh, so you have to squeeze mm -hmm. almost everything in this because if the audio is too long, children are very likely to fall asleep. <laughs> so there is no time to say much else, I think. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there any other question? We have time for one more. Uh, we have a, a one minute left. No? Okay. Uh, thank you, Maria Lisa, for your um, interesting thank you. talk. Right? Thank you very much. With the present with the session. Our next speaker uh, is Ana Cristina Vida Esperanza from the University of Zaragoza. And uh, um, the title of her presentation is Gender Representation on Female Disability in Science Crowdfunding Challenge Multimodal Analysis of Project Videos for the IGN and sorry, Research Competition. Right, let me share. Uh, all right, now you should be able to upload your presentation. Can you see my yes. presentation? Yes. Uh, it's maximized. Excellent. That's fine. Good. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. I'm gonna... Okay. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yes, my name is Ana Cristina Vila Esperanza, and uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Zaragoza. For my doctoral thesis, I'm studying uh, digital genre of science, and in this talk, I'm going to present an interdisciplinary study that combines gender analysis and gender studies through a multimodal analysis that uh, intends to show how women and men are represented in a digital genre of science, the crowdfunding project video. Okay, so in this talk, I will first refer to the research background line behind this paper. Second, I will state the main names of the study. Third, I will explain the materials collected for the analysis and the analytical approaches adopted. And finally, I will present the most salient findings and I will draw some final conclusions. So first, I'm going to contextualize the genre I'm studying. Crowdfunding is an online practice whose aim is to collect a small amounts of money from a large number of people. And this is a strategy ever more used by scientists to collect donations for the scientific projects. There are crowdfunding websites that host scientific projects, such as experiment.com. And in this platform, scientists can create a profile and upload a project to be crowdfunded. And they can also include a video explaining their project. And this is the element of the genre that I'm analyzing. And the study of these videos is important from a genre perspective because it shows new trends in science communication and popularization, uh, in this case, also in research funding. And because, um, as previous research has found, um, campaigns, crowdfunding campaigns with videos have more chances to be successful. In parallel to crowdfunding campaigns and the digital genres emerging around them, we have the following situation with regards to the role that women play in STEM disciplines, those disciplines involved in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Historically, these disciplines have been considered masculine, and even if the number of women in these disciplines is growing these days, men continue to outnumber women, and therefore women are underrepresented in STEM research areas. Um, some statistics from 2019 and 2020 show that women make up only 29% of the STEM labor force worldwide, and only 19% of STEM company board members are women. And when we talk about leading positions in the STEM industry, the data is even more alarming, given that only 3% of women occupy managing positions. So why is this happening? Why so few women in STEM disciplines? 
Well, previous research confirms that one potential factor that determines women professional choices is the perpetuation of gender stereotypes and biases about what careers are suitable for men and for women. This is the case of STEM fields, which have always been male dominated, given the invisibilization that the work of female scientists has had a long history. It is part of our social cultural heritage, unfortunately. Um, these stereotypes, uh, however, have led to societies to the adoption of popular false beliefs like boys are better than girls at maths and science. Um, um, I don't know about you, but at least uh, I was taught this when, uh, during my childhood. I, I remember listening to this type of, of beliefs. Um, and this belief has not been supported by scientific evidence whatsoever. And all these stereotypes and false beliefs are reinforced by a lack of female role models that may discourage scientific interest among women. Let's see, let's say that we are in a kind of vicious circle. The fact that very few women perform STEM related jobs uh, makes that women may not see themselves reflected in science professions and that may discourage scientific interest among women. So given this context, uh, in this research, I wanted to see if those stereotypes about gender and science are reinforced in pro funding project videos of STEM. And by studying the verbal and visual content of these videos, I answered the following questions. Uh, are women researchers underrepresented in these videos? What roles do women and men adopt when communicating science? And how are male and female identities constructed in these videos? And to answer these questions, I conducted a case study of eight videos dealing with STEM projects from 2015 to 2019. Um, the videos were collected from the website experiment.com that I mentioned earlier. And in them, we find female and male undergraduate students from the US uh, that participate in an international science competition called IGEM, which stands for International Genetically Engineered Mission, and I selected undergraduate students uh, because I wanted to see um, this from the point of view of, of new generations of, of scientists. As for the methods, I adopted two analytical approaches to analyze the verbal content of the videos. I did a solution move analysis, which identifies the sections of the text or rhetorical units or moves of the text. And for the visual images, I applied present the Lewin's visual grammar model. Um, so this case study shows that in those funding project videos of STEM, women are underrepresented and men are clear protagonists. Men are the main characters, adopt the role of expert scientists and are depicted as powerful and confident. And on the other hand, women are the secondary characters, adopt the role of observers of the experts and show themselves I'm um, kind and caring to maintain a relationship of social affinity with the audience. And in the following slides, I'm going to illustrate how I've reached these conclusions. I'm going to start with the visual content of the videos. And first, I'm going to focus on the analysis of salience. According to Crescent Balloon, the greater the weight of an element in an image, the greater its salience. When an element is made more visible in an image, it is for viewers to pay more attention to it, to make it more important. This can be done, for instance, by putting the most relevant elements in the foreground and the least important in the background. In the videos, I found that when men and women are recorded together in the same shot, men occupy more space than women and are made more salient than women, as can be seen in these examples here. Uh, I would like to show you more, but we have time restrictions. Here we see two men standing in the foreground of the image and two women standing behind them in the background. And in this concrete example, we also see that men occupy most of the space and women are like cornered in the right side. Men's salience can also be seen very easily by the little number of women that we see in the images. In this example here, uh, there is one woman at the background against five men in the foreground. And in this other example, we find a research group of 10 people out of which only two members are female. So these are just some examples that demonstrate very quickly that women are underrepresented in these science videos. Another visual aspect to analyze how researchers are represented is by seeing the actions they perform in the videos. 
Uh, present value and state that uh, we have three types of participants in an action, the actors or the doers of an action, the goals or receivers of the action, and the reactors, the ones that look at other people's actions. And visually, we observe participation through vectors. Vectors are visual elements um, that indicate an action, and the actor is the participant from whom the vector emanates. We're going to see this much better with the examples. In the first example, the man is talking to someone on his left side and the vector emanates from his gaze at the gesture he's doing with the arm. We do not see the goal because we do not see who he's talking to. As for the women, they are not actors here, but reactors of the man's action because they are simply looking at what he is doing or, well, in this case, saying. In this other example, we have a similar situation. The man is the actor, and in this case, the goals are the materials or laboratory equipment he is manipulating. And again, we have the woman playing the role of the reactor in the background. And what is interesting about this is that in the videos, you always see the man is represented as the actor, and the woman sometimes appears as the actor as well. But the difference is that I have no examples of men represented as reactors of women's actions, whereas the contrary can be found in several locations. Um, this example is even clearer. In this scene, we have two men and a woman in the laboratory. The sequence shows how the two men are performing the lab work together. And in the last sequence, we see that they also talk to each other. And what is interesting here is that the woman remains a sub reactor along the whole sequence. She remains passive and she's just looking at what they are doing. She does not intervene in the doing or in the talking. We would say that men are the protagonists of the actions and the woman appears to adopt a secondary role. Chris and Valuin also found a similar situation in the research in which they found that it was very often to find the man as a doer and the woman as a faithful admirer of his actions when a man and a woman are depicted in the same image. And this is what we see here. Uh, when women and men appear in the same scene, men perform the scientific work and women do the looking. Um, the next visual element I'm going to explore is the gaze. Chris and Van Leeuwen state that in scientific illustration, no eye contact with the audience is preferred. In these videos, we see very often that when male researchers are engaged in laboratory work, they do not look at the camera, but they pretend they are not being watched. The scene looks as if they have been caught by chance in the act of working. You can see that in these examples where they look very concentrated on what they're doing. And that makes them look disengaged with us, with the audience, but at the same time, it makes them look professional and it makes the whole situation credible from the viewer's side, from our side. However, we find that when women are performing laboratory work in the media, Just a brief introduction to let you know that we still have five minutes to go. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. So women, uh, when they are performing laboratory work in these videos, they behave differently. They do not pretend they are not being watched, but they engage with us, not only with a direct gaze, but with a smile, through which, according to Chris Van Leeuwen, the viewer is asked to enter into a relation of social affinity with them. Here we, you have some examples. We definitely get a positive impression from someone who smiles at us, right? But it also makes the working situation kind of access. We feel that they have been told what to do in front of the camera before being recorded, and then they are looking for approval. Um, we see through this behavior that it seems that women feel they need to look gentle and nice rather than professional, and it is important for them to enter in a positive relationship with the audience. As for the vertical angle of recording, this is an element that gives us hints about power relations. This is an important point to see how identities are constructed. Um, Chris and Valuin state that when someone is recorded from a low vertical angle, they are depicted as superior and powerful with regards to the viewers. And on the contrary, high angles make the participants look inferior and powerless. What I have found is that in many occasions, men are recorded from a low angle, and that makes the relation between them and us in as what one in which they have power over us, but they are superior to us. This angle is common to be found when recording men, but I didn't find any examples uh, when recording women, and I feel this is interesting to see how both women and men are depicted in terms of power. And finally, I'm going to refer to the verbal content of the videos. Uh, through a move analysis, I could identify eight moves or sections that make up the spoken narratives. And I found something really interesting as well. For starters, 
I found that men do most of the talking in the video since they do the majority of moves. So men are also made more visible through speaking time. And what is even more interesting is that the moves uh, that men perform are related to the explanation of scientific phenomena, um, the establishment of credentials and the interpretation, the interpretation of scientific data. And women, on the other hand, perform those moves in which they ask for support and thank viewers. That's to say, those moves that do not offer any significant information about the project itself or the researchers, but simply aim to establish an intimate connection with the audience and demand something from them. From these results, I have concluded that the visual and verbal content of these videos contribute to the reinforcement of gender stereotypes in STEM disciplines because it unresolves the lack of female role models in these disciplines and because the roles adopted in the videos, expert role in the case of men and secondary role in the case of women, may reinforce the false belief that girls are not good at STEM disciplines. And one of the objectives of the Agenda 2030 set by the United Nations is to achieve gender equality in all private and public spheres. And regarding the um, gender gaps in STEM, it is stated that it is not the result of innate ability, but rather due to the socialization process, including gender stereotypes. Thus, addressing on the representation of women um, in STEM requires an accelerated holistic approach. The results of this research also have some limitations. First, my case study focuses on videos for the Asian research competition. And the fact that I found gender and STEM stereotypes reinforcing them does not mean that this behavior can be generalized to all crowdfunding videos. But um, in this sense, it would be interesting, however, to compare these results with others in future videos to observe if there is a pattern. And I hope this study can shed light on that direction. And finally, um, it would also be really useful to combine this multimodal analysis with ethnographic methods such as interviews and context observation that would give us an insight on females' own perception as researchers. Um, to finish off, I would like to acknowledge that this is our contribution to the project Digital Rambas and Open Science, funded by the Spanish Ministry of Science and Innovation. Um, these are the references uh, cited along this uh, talk. And uh, well, that's everything. Thank you so much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them to the best of my knowledge. Thanks. Thank you very much, Magrosina, for your interesting talk. So we have time for some questions. Right, I've got a question for you, uh, uh, Ana Cristina. I'm not sure if you said that, but uh, um, were uh, these subjects uh, able to read a script for the competition? Or, I mean, when they made the videos for the competition, were they have to, did they have to follow the script? Right. Um... Well, I guess they, they prepared what they're going to say in advance, of course, but um, when they are intervening in the in the scientific explanation or whatever they say, they don't seem to be reading anything. They just, right. yeah, yeah. Right. they just uh, go uh, move by move, uh, explaining what, uh, what the project is about, uh, claiming the competence as, as researchers and, um, and yeah, continuing uh, uh, each move, uh, but uh, it doesn't seem that they are reading. Right. At least from. Yeah, my, my question is because I know that some of these crowdfunding places, and sometimes they provide you with a script that you need to follow. I mean, not textual script, but they say in the first part of your presentation, say who you are, and then you continue to move on to your, uh, I don't know, your hobbies. Uh, next step, this and that. But yeah. Uh, yeah, my question is, uh, uh, is that is that really a script? Uh, I mean, did you happen to read the script yourself before the study, or or, or it didn't exist? Uh, you mean you mean that if it's uh, spontaneous or or they it is exactly. prepared yes. in advance, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I guess they they prepare it in advance. Well, this is something that I should ask the researchers myself, but. But I guess they um, in the experiment.com uh, platform, uh, they've got they've got some guidelines that uh, they can follow with some recommendations on what to include in the videos. 
Uh, they also add more things because according to the classification of moves that I that I found, they um, they include more moves that that those that are recommended in the platform. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I yeah. I guess that they read the guidelines before present before um, creating the video before preparing what they are going to say. But yeah, what is interesting uh, is that yeah, precisely those moves that convey, let's say, the the, the smart uh, explanations of scientific uh, evidence or, or, or background, uh, it is always made by, by men and not by, right. by women, and that attracted my attention. Yeah, to me, that's an interesting fact, because you are, you are giving somehow some kind of a textual uh, trigger, and then they follow the trigger, and then what you can study is the responses, you know? Uh, how how they present how they actually introduce themselves, for example, what kinds of strategies they use. Mm -hmm, perhaps mm -hmm. these can be very interesting gender-based parameters. In this in this uh, type of videos, in special, they uh, they do not spend much time introducing themselves. They introduce themselves as a team because these crowdfunding projects are intended for this item competition thing. So. They just uh, simply state when they introduce themselves, they just say, well, we are IGM wow. uh, team from uh, Michigan or from Massachusetts. But, but what is interesting is that, yeah, they, when they give uh, scientific explanations, um, they, are, they don't introduce themselves through verbal language, through spoken narrative, sorry, but uh, you can see um, verbal language displayed on, on screen. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank yeah. you very much.